Uh, hi, everyone. I'm a developer, and I tweet sometimes. And I know this looks like an introduction, so I'm introducing myself, but this actually isn't the case. The thing is that usually when you read how to hold a good presentation, how to give a good talk, they say that you should usually start with a personal note, an anecdote of some sort. And I'm trying to establish that a lot of us here, yes, are developers, and the majority of us does tweet sometimes, at least in my case. And the thing is that in, when you're holding a technical talk, it isn't that easy to start on a personal note. Usually the speaker presents a framework, a tool of some sort. It would be like when a carpenter would be here speaking, and he would hold a presentation about a hammer, not personal really, correct? But the thing is actually that if the carpenter started talking about how he uses the hammer, how the hammer helps him get his job done quicker, it's much more personal. So let me start with a personal story. Uh, a couple of weeks back, but this happens every now and then, basically, I. I need to solve a problem because I don't see developers as coders. A lot of people that are in this business think that people are, that code are like programmers. That's not the case. Developers are problem solvers. So I was looking for a solution online and I thought I found the perfect library to fix my problem. But the problem with that is that I found myself at 3 a.m. screaming, pulling my hair out, thinking I could have implemented this myself for three hours and here I am in 3 a.m. in my office wasting time on trying to implement someone else's solution. So who does feel sometimes like this? Who has burned themselves by using a library? Of course, this is the type of question where everybody raises a hand and now we're all, all joined. So you all know the title of the presentation. And now another question, who uses any of these, these software? So we're all using package managers. And the great thing about package manager is in the recent years, the amount of abstraction that you can get to install something with just line of code. So to install a composer, just one line of code. To install CocoaPot, just one, one line of code. To install NPM, just one line of code. And with this, we get access to Mil okay, not millions, really, but thousands and thousands of libraries that we can use. So let's say, for example, if you want to manipulate time in PHP, you can require Carbon. If you want to use an MVC framework, you can use Rails. If you want to implement in your Objective-C project Google Maps, you just hit bot Google Maps. If you want to use Express, just npm ins install Express. Same thing with Django. And the thing is, all of these libraries that I mentioned are really heavenly to use. You really enjoy using all of these libraries. But there are a lot, a lot, a lot of libraries that are really hard to implement. And the thing is, this usually happens because we as developers, for some screwed up reason, think that overcomplicating stuff is good. So we even have terms like AR, DDD, solid, dry, TDD, BDD, DDD again, love, Demeter, AOP, E, DM, ORM. So all these terms that mean almost nothing to anyone else, even not to some people in this room, even not to me. I don't know what AOP is. I have just Google scribbly stuff. <coughs> but, sorry. Okay. Um, and this will make you go insane, literally. The thing with this is, because we have a switch in our head, I guess, when we become developers to overcomplicate everything, for some reason we start making even someone else's life more miserable. But the thing is, we all learned everything that we need in just these three simple words, so inheritance, encapsulation, and polymorphism. And this is for object-oriented programming correct, but you can use a lot of stuff from here in non-object-oriented programming languages. And the thing is that you don't need all of those terms. Those terms are really good if you want to communicate a more or less complex idea with someone, but these are all three things that you need to write good software, basically. So why does it come to this? There can be numerous reasons. So let's say, for example, cow cowboy coding, or the manager pops into the office like, this needs to be done yesterday, or the one I hate the most is I'll refactor this later. And we get stuff like this. This is taken from a real website in Serbia, the bus plus ticketing system, and it's called Do Work 2. And the problem with calling a function Do Work 2 is it's like a movie sequel. It's like you walk into Lord of the Rings 2 and you never watch it, and you're like, what the fuck? What are they doing? Why do they want to throw the ring in the mountain? Like, what's happening? And when a junior developer comes into the team, he doesn't have a lot of experience. This is really, really bad for them. They can learn a lot of bad stuff like this. So this is bad design, and I'm especially using the word design, which isn't that much used when talking about code, but this is bad design. So using super globals or stuff like that basically yields bad design, and this can screw up a lot of code. So how can we fix this? First of all, I refactor this later, is like we can still be friends, so when you say this, you probably won't do it. Also, I will have to use some terms, but I will explain them better, so we'll go quickly over dry, solid, and object calisthenics and a couple of design patterns if we have the time. So DRY is basically an acronym for do not repeat yourself, but we like complex, complex acronyms, as I said. So basically, if you see something that you use in a lot of places, just extract it to a function. Easy, correct. 
Then we have SOLID. Uh, SOLID is an acronym standing for five stuff that is basically inherent to encapsulation and polymorphism, but for some reason we need to overcomplicate stuff. So S stands for single responsibility principle, which is the same thing to do. It's also another S word. Um, it's the same thing to do that one class does just one thing, and that's it. Then we have the open-close principle. If I'm uh, using someone else's library, I shouldn't be forced to open up the source code and change the source code if I want to change something. It would be much better if I can just extend their class and use it like that. Then we have the list of substitution principle. Wow. The thing is, it's basic polymorphism. You can use child classes in place of the parent classes. Then we have the interface segregation principle, which says, Smaller interfaces are much better than larger interfaces. Nobody wants to implement ent empty methods. And then we have the dependency inversion, which is the only thing that isn't that much covered with the inheritance polymorphism and encapsulation, which says you should always rely on abstractions and not concrete implementations. So object calisthenics, basically, is uh, nine practices you can use so your code is much more readable and much better. And if you do these nine things, it will yield great results. So only one, line, uh, only one level of indentation per method. And basically, then you say, like, how can I use this if statement, like seven ifs nested? The thing is basically that you extract it to a function. So try again. We're repeating ourselves. Don't use the else keyword. This is called defensive programming. So always return early. So because if you ever read, like, an if, else, if, else, if, else, if, if, then if, if, if. That, that is really, really, really bad to read. And even some languages have built this into them, so Swift has the guard keyword for, de for defensive programming. REPL primitives and strings. I think this is really important. There's an anti-pattern called, called primitive obsession, which is basically uh, when, you, let's say, for example, you're using a scoring library, and for some reason the developer thought that for a player score it would be great if you call player.setscore, player dot, and then in the brackets, player dot score plus one. It would be much better player dot increment score, and then in the bracket, one. First class collection. So if you have any type of collection, you should wrap it up in a class, and any manipulation of that collection, so any logic for manipulation, should be written inside that class. Then one dot per line. Uh, this is also called the tell don't ask principle. Basically, again, complex stuff, but basically it says, uh, for example, if you have an event system, you shouldn't have to go event, get transaction, get response, get body, get HTML. It, it should be just event, get HTML if you really need it. And don't abbreviate stuff. Don't do work too. Don't, don't do work too. So uh, keep all entities small. This is, again, sane. As, as, ah, the classes should be as small as they can be. No classes with more than two instance variables. This can, this can be really hard, but if you wrap all primitives and everything else, you can really get out and do all the stuff in just two instance variables. And no getters, setters, and properties. We're going again back to tell them tasks. So. Now I'll try to explain, at least for myself, what makes a piece of code nice to use. It should be easy to implement. So I shouldn't waste more time implementing someone else's code than it should take it for me to write it myself. It's eloquent. So if I open up the source code, I don't want to see abbreviations. I don't want to see some mumbo jumbo. And basically, I don't want to see something that looks like functional programming. And for example, I'm using C sharp. Uh, and by eloquency, I don't mean this. Actually, this is a real class in the Java Swing framework. And it's, it's much easier to read in the haiku form. So internal frame, internal frame, title pane, internal frame, title pane, maximize button, windows not focus state. I think we all know where in the window this button is actually located. So. And the most important thing is it just works. One of the best libraries I ever used is an Objective-C keyboard manager that I just had to pod and then IQ something. I don't remember the name of the library, keyboard manager. And it just started working, literally no configuration. So I guess the question we will try to answer today is how to write code that just works. So let's put up some ground rules. So the developer should not care about the internal. So if I don't want to read the source code, I really, really, really don't want to have op to open a file to see why something happened. The code should lead the developers. So like when dancing, for example, the leader in the dance leads the follower. And it's, uh, the experience of the follower is much better if the, if the leader is leading him correctly. So much leading. The behavior should be easy to change, easily changeable by the developer. So basically, this means it should be modular. It should be really easy for the developer to configure stuff without too much hassle. So basically, stuff that we, I will go quickly over that people don't actually use, I think, in a correct way, is interfaces, abstract classes, tricks, exception, and exceptions. And if we have some time, we will go over the strategy and the combat, command bus patterns. So first, 
uh, I was thinking in which language to write the examples in, and for some reason I even got feedback that PHP is a really bad one, but I think most of us here know PHP, plus if you can write good code in PHP, so if you can make PHP safer for somebody not to screw it up, I think then it's much easier for you to do that, let's say in Java, C Sharp, or any other language. So the first time I read about interfaces was in a blog post. And I'm not invalidating my knowledge. Blog posts are actually a really good place to learn stuff. Uh, they mentioned the interface as a contract. So basically, they said then a class has to do something that they signed up the contract for. And basically, how you should look at this is if you go to a bank and you want to open an account, you never see something like this. And the cashier goes, here is all the paperwork needed. And you have to search for all of the pages of pages of paperwork documentation if we're using code and stuff like that. So interfaces lead the developer through the code. And just for fun, there is Java here. <laughs> anyway, so uh, let's say we're being, building a string decorator interface. So uh, when, we give, uh, when we try to consume the developer's class, and from now on I will call the developer a user, you will see why, um, we will expect that if we call the decorate, a decorate function, we get back a string that is in some way changed. So, and the thing with this is, is known consumption. So if you're like writing a library, you should usually consume somebody else's part of the code because then you can do validation, then you can do your logic, and you can be sure the developer himself is using the library as you have intended. The behavior is expected because it's all really, really, really self-explanatory. The developer can expect what will happen, and you can also expect the developer will do everything as it should be done. So then again, abstract classes, and we will go quickly over this also. So let's say, for example, now we want to make a class that is a regex decorator. So we use a regular expression to change something in the string. And uh, just to see, so it's implementing the string decorator. I hate people that use laser pointers, but this is actually fun to use. Okay, so. Uh, we have only two instance variables, so regular, exp uh, regular expression and replacement. We have two abstract functions, and we will see, we will see why they're abstract, so get regular expression and get replacement. We have the protected function replace, uh, which uses preg replace just to do the regular expression, and then we're implementing the decorate function from the interface, so from the contract. And now here is something interesting. First note that the constructor is final. So no class that extends this class can write a new constructor. And you can do this in numerous languages. You can do this in Objective-C. You can do this in C-sharp if you turn on unsafe code and stuff like that. And it's really useful because the, more, uh, the less freedom the developer has, however sadistic this sounds, it's better for them and also better for your library. And here we're calling, so we're setting the values of regular expression to this get regular expression. And if you remember, that function was abstract. So if the developer extends this class, he has to define the regular expression. Also the same thing for replacement. And the thing is, the developer is forced to declare all the attributes we think we need. Again, the consumption is known, it's expected behavior, and everything is self-explanatory. So another thing that we can use is traits. So let's say, for example, we want to make a, mod, a, mod, a module that you can just put into a class and it can decorate. And for example, we can uh, make an abstract function called getDecorators. And now, and now a lot of people would think not all languages have traits, but you can actually do this in JavaScript. You can create an object. And then when you're consuming someone else's object, you can check if there is a function that is said that you need. And then you can throw an exception if it's not. The same thing in Java. You can make an, um, an anonymous class. So if you make an abstract class and they have to use it and they cannot extend it because it's final, they will have to define the functions that are abstract. And it's the same thing like having this here. Okay, so, and then if the, de the developer, let's say, for example, is building a decorator queue, if he uses the trait, he will be forced to declare the get decorators function, and then he can, uh, he can return the decorators that we want to use. And so it's modular, it's, it's extensible, and it's really simple. Okay, another thing, exceptions. I don't see a lot of people actually using exceptions, but it's okay to break someone's code. It's totally okay to be a little baby. Babies, when they don't like someone, they just go and throw stuff around, and you should do that. If you got something that you didn't want in your code, in your library, you should really tell the developer that's bad. So, okay. Uh, so let's say, for example, in the decorate function, PHP doesn't have type hints, so uh, primitive type hints, so we can check if it's a string, and if it's not, we can say the return value should be a string. Anyway, and the thing is, there is a lot of development noise. If I was speaking like this, it would be much harder for you to understand anything. If you have to read a lot of documentation, I'm not sure if you're hearing it. The thing is, 
if you have a lot of noise in your development, so if you have to go through pages and pages of documentation, if you have to write numerous configuration files, if you have to read the source code, it's really hard to implement something, just as before, now that I have put, uh, it's done with the sickness. So when I played the song, it was really hard for you to hear anything. And it's the same thing with code. And the whole point of this, basically, is that we usually do not think of, de of developers as users. When somebody is using your library, he is, by definition, a user. And we always talk about user experience. Like, if you put this button here, it's not really simple for the user to find that feature. Well, the same thing can be said for developers. So we never really talk about developer UX. It's really, really, really important if you're sharing your code that you not, don't make someone else's code more miserable. Because for some reason, we're, okay, we're not OK with a program that looks like this, but we're totally okay, OK with wasting 20 hours just to get the hell world of the project up and running. Okay, so the strategy pattern is really good for consumption. So, for example, let's say that we were making a decorator queue, and we wanted to let the developer, for example, pass in his own queue, and then we can wrap that up in a decorator. Hmm, okay, so a decorator instance queue class, and if he put if, if he passes it into the constructor, then his implementation of the queue will be used. And by that way, he's, imp uh, he's explicitly saying that he wants to change the, the, uh, the behavior of the code, plus you know that you're all hands off. Also, command bus, I think this is literally the best design pattern. The best design pattern, it's such a buzzword. But yeah, uh, it's the best uh, design pattern because basically you have commands and you have command handlers. And basically the developer writes uh, a simple object, so just values, nothing else. So, for example, if we want to have a send invoice command, I guess it would have a user field and it would have, let's say, the payment amount. So he just makes a send invoice command. And then you can morph that command. You can use stuff, let's say, for example, in the pipeline, you can log stuff from that command, like I will send an invoice to this address, I will try. You can shoot off events, you can do a lot of stuff. And then you pass it to a handler and where you do the actual sending. So now I'll introduce myself. Hi, everyone. My name is Bogdan Habich, but you could have got that from the Twitter handle. Uh, I study computer science at the Faculty of Computing in, in Belgrade. I work as a backend developer in Devana, and thank you for listening. So are there any questions? And also, if you can rate me on JoinedIn, it really helps me as Luca said, level myself up as a, as a speaker. And also, please, please, please rate all of, the, uh, all of the rest of the speakers because it really means a lot to us. So, yeah.